Bibles, please turn to Judges chapter 16. Now just listen carefully, we'll read. Judges 16, we begin reading at verse 25. Father, we worship you in this place on tonight. We thank you, God, for the testimony. you've chosen us, God, to go through things that it can bring glory to your name, and God, that we can grow stronger all the more. We bless your name, God. I'll be reading from Judges chapter 16, this evening, verse 25. Play that softly, please, Brandon. Judges 16, verse 25. So it happened when their hearts were merry that they said, call for Samson, that he may perform for us. So they called for Samson from the prison, and he performed for them. And they stationed him between the pillars. Then Samson said to the lad, who held him by the hand, let me fill the pillars which support the temple so that I can lean on them. Now the temple was full of men and women, all the lords of the Philistines were there, about 3,000 men and women on the roof watching Samson perform. Then Samson called to the Lord, saying, O oh Lord God, remember me. I pray, strengthen me, I pray, just this once, O oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistines for my two eyes. And Samson took hold of the two middle piers which supported the temple, and he braced himself against him, one on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. And the temple fell on the Lord's and all the people who were in it. So the dead that he killed, so the dead that he killed at his death were more than he had killed in his life. Let us pray, Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, Lord, we glorify you. We worship you, Father. Father, would you open our hearts to receive your word, to receive your encouragement for 2012. God, anoint your people. Give them an ear to hear. Anoint your servant, God, that I may speak your word with boldness and clarity. Jesus' name, amen. Amen. Keeping with our theme for this evening, I titled this message, I'm Still Standing. All right. God, I want to get you to interact a little bit. Look at your name and say, I'm still standing. I'm still, I'm still standing. standing. See? <laughs> I don't know everyone's situation in this house this evening, but I know there's been some things you have been through that you did not know how you exactly going to make it out of That's it. right. But look at to someone else on the other side and say, but I'm still standing. But I'm still standing. I'm still standing. There have been some trials. There have been some traveling down all around the country here. And your wife, help me, help me. But I know she would say the same, I'm still standing. standing. That's right. I've found that through this year, there's been certain things that we had to go through as a couple, raising kids, job situation, financial situation, and Brother Lesser, you are such an inspiration. That's right. And 2012 will be our year that we're going to start that snowball. But through all those things, family, through all those things, eating french fries and pancakes and eating yep, yep. noodles and not knowing where the next check is going to come from, through all that, we're still standing. 
when we go into 2012 here in 45 minutes, Lord's willing, we'll still be standing. That's right. And not just standing on the victories and the conquers, mm -hmm. conquer, conquers that we've got, the conquests we've had in 2011, but standing on the hope and the promise that lies ahead in That's 2012. Right. That's right. See, I am believing that this year will be something different for us. As we walk into the mindset in 2012 that God still has us here for a purpose. And when I look at the story of Samson, I begin reading through Judges 13, 14, 15, and 16. I begin to see how Samson was born in his mother's womb for a purpose. If you look with me in Judges, if you have your Bible, look at Judges 13. Look in verse 4. Just a little background on the story. Samson's parents were old in age that they were married. And then the angel of the Lord comes to Samson's mother and tells her, I think her name is Zora, tells her, tells her that she will conceive a son and that son will be born a Nazarite unto God, which is a covenant that God is specifically making, and he is not to shave his head. And he will come forth for the very purpose of delivering the children of Israel out of the oppressions of the Philistines. See, at this time, family, of course, as we know from reading through the Old Testament, the, the Israelites, they're, they're what, as the scripture most would call them, a stiff-necked people, an obstinate people. Uh, so they found themselves under oppression or under the hand of the Philistine. And God comes down to this older lady and her husband and tells them, you will conceive a son, and that son, Samson, will save the Israelites from the hand of the oppression by the Philistines. First thing we see in the story of Samson family is that Samson had a purpose for living. Samson had a purpose for standing at the end of his life. Right. Kind of get away from my message, but this is kind of where I want to go and kind of get us to see from the story of Samson that even though Samson made some mistakes through his life, God still had him standing at the very end because he had a purpose. So my encouragement to you as you walk into 2012, that simply because you are standing here this morning, Sorry, this evening. Just because you're standing here this evening, know that God still has a purpose and a work for you. That's right. That though you experienced some tests and some trials and some troubles through 2011, though you made some mistakes and had some bad decisions, made some wrong terms, did some things you should have done, though you did all those things, as Samson done some of those, you are still standing because God has a purpose for you. Mm -hmm. Let's look a little bit more at Samson's life. Judges 14 through 16 will tell us that Samson was a man who, he, he seemed to have been given to women who, he, you know, his family would, him, would like not him to be too. For example, his first wife was, was of the Philistines. He liked this woman. He saw this woman, he thought she was pretty, and he, it was well pleasing to her. So he asked his parents, say, go get her for me. I want to marry her, my paraphrase. Now, the parents did not want her, want him to marry someone of a Philistine background. He said, the dad said, well, can't you not find somebody among my family? Can't you find someone here in our own land of our own people type? So you won't have to marry the Philistine. But look at a certain verse I want you to look at. Look at verse 4. Judges 14, verse 4. I'm going to start from verse 1 so you get the context. Now, Samson went down to Timnah. And saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. So he went up and told his fathers and mothers, saying, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as a wife. Here's Samson telling his parents, look, I want to marry this girl. You go get her for me. Verse 3, then his father and mother said to him, is there no woman among the daughters of your brethren? Are all among my people that you must go and get a wife from the uncircumcised Philistine? And Samson said to his father, Get her for me, for she pleases me well. Key verse, look at verse 4. But his father and mother did not know that it was of the Lord, that he was seeking, listen, look at this family, 
that he was seeking an occasion to move against the Philistines. For at that time, the Philistines had dominion over Israel. Mm. If you read verse 4, what did you get out of that? Talk back to me. God had a plan. Yeah. See, Samson wanted the woman. He wanted the Philistine, the daughters of the Philistine. And, and to his, unbeknowing to him, it was all part of God's plan. Point the note for yourself. The testing and the trials you have went through this year. The testing and the trials that you will go to in 2012 and beyond is all a part of God's plan. See, God is working something behind the scenes that you and I are always not privy to. That's right. So while, while his parents say, no, can't you find somebody else to marry? God will say, no, 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 I have a plan that I'm working through this daughter of the Philistines. See, remember, remember now, remember, his purpose was to come deliver the Israelites out of the hands of the Philistines. So the one thing that Samson had to do would be able to get in there and infiltrate or become a frenemy, excuse me, frenemy, frenemy of the Philistines so he can get in there and accomplish his purpose and destiny that God has ordained him for. When I began reading, I said, God, you, 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 you're telling me that at times, if not all the time, certain situations and trials in our life, you take us through because there's a plan, a massive plan that you and I just don't know. And God says, exactly. Because all things work together for the good of those who love me and are called according to my purpose. And since then, no matter what the bad is, no matter what the good is, it's working out for your good and for God's glory. So Samson marries this Philistine woman, and then this woman, he presses her. This woman presses him to tell him the, a riddle about the, the lion that he killed along the way. So let's fast forward a little bit. After the Philistine woman, then he went to the lion. We all heard the story about the lie, the harlot. He saw this harlot. She looked very pleased to him again. Here's another one looked pleased to him. And he went into the harlot. And the harlot, he ended up marrying the harlot. So now the harlot presses him. He, through this time here in chapter 15, we learn that, that uh, uh, Samson began to get stronger. He began to start slaying uh, hundreds and thousands of men. And they wanted to figure out or find out what is Samson's strength. So they, they go to Delilah and they say, hey, go, go talk to your husband. And, and, you know, and, and uh, I've got kids in the room, so I'm not going to say anything. You know, go talk to the, your husband and figure out what it is, uh, where his strength comes from. Just give you some background. I want you to understand where we're going here. So Samson, so Delilah, over and over again, tell me where you're strength. So he tells her this. He tells her that each, that each and every time it was a lie. It was not the truth. So they would come in and try to uh, overtake Samson. Now remember, family, Samson was a frenemy of the Philistines. He was born and created, he was formed in his mother's womb to, to relieve the Israelites of their oppression by the Philistines. So the Philistines already hated Samson. Samson had married one of their daughters. Samson had uh, slayed 30 of their men. Samson had done several things that hey, they did not like Samson. So they wanted to buy him, they wanted to capture him and render him useless. And we read later on that after Delilah pressed and pressed and pressed on Samson, that Samson finally told Delilah exactly where his strength is. His strength lies in his locks, his long hair. I think the Bible said that he has seven locks in his hair. Maybe think of the dreadlocks. Maybe I'll start growing dreadlocks. No. <laughs> My wife, she half asleep. God bless you. Anyways, anyway, so Samson told Delilah where, where his strength lies was in here. And then after she, he told her, she goes to the Philistines and says, hey, I will cut his hair. And then after I cut his hair, you can come in and overtake him. So she did just that. And the Philistine came in and uh, bound him up and poke his eyes out. Put both of his eyes out. Now let's pick, up, pick this up in the text we read this we read. 16, chapter 16. So here Samson is. He's in the prison now. He has no eyes. 
You would think, family, that Samson is at the, is at the very end of his life. You would think that Samson is saying, God, there is nowhere else I can go. There's nothing else I can do. I might as well just sit here and die. But then they called, look at God's plan. They called for Samson to come in and entertain them to perform for them. And as he was being led in, he asked the lads, let me fill the pillars. See, see, when I, I, I want to believe that as, as Samson began to get his locks back, his, the Bible actually says it, his hair began to grow back and began to get his strength back. That as Samson began to get his strength back, he also began to get that anointing of God over him. Because the anointing of the Lord was found in his hair. That's where his strength was. So I want to believe that as Samson began to get his strength, that he began to stand up and rise. And when they brought him into, the, into this place where they were, remember now, it's, imagine these two, these two columns here. Are pillars. And there's a balcony above us. So they were over down, overlooking him as, they would, as he would entertain them. So he asked the lads, he put me between the two pillars. He wanted to go to the pillar where, the, where it was holding up the place. And he says in verse 28, O Lord God, remember me, I pray. Strengthen me, I pray, just this once. God, I know I've made some bad decisions. God, I know I shouldn't have done this. God, I know I shouldn't have made this wrong turn here. But God, just this once, could you strengthen me one more time? Somebody say, I'm still standing. I'm still standing. Oh God, that I may with one blow take vengeance on the Philistine with my two eyes. And Samson took hold of those two middle piers which supported the temple. And he braced himself against them. One on his right and the other on his left. Then Samson said, let me die with the Philistines. And he pushed with all his might. Samson, in so many words, probably said to himself, <laughs> I'm still standing. After all I've been through, after you done pulled out my eyes, after you just sent these women in here to, to, to uh, uh, oppress me for, my, for my, 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 the secret of my strength. Uh, no, 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 no. After you then mocked me. Remember, they brought him in up out of the prison so, they, so he can perform for him. They were mocking him, family. So surely something had to rise up in Samson and says, one last time, God, I'm still standing, God. I know you still can do something through me, God. One last time, and family, this is what I see in this story. God did not take Samson out completely when his eyes was gouged out because God had created a purpose from him for the very beginning of time. So here's what I want to encourage you this, this evening as you go into 2012. There's three questions I posed before us this morning, this evening, as we look into this title, I'm Still Standing. First, why? God, why am I still here this evening? Maybe you're asking, or maybe you're saying to yourself, God, I've made some problems, I've made some mistakes throughout this year, but yet you still have me here. God, I was here and somebody else died and said to me, God, why am I still standing? God, why am I debt free and not the other person? God, why am I employed and not the other person? Why, God, am I still standing? The second question to ponder this evening is, God, how is it, Father, that I am still standing today? By what means, God, by what, by what, what are you doing in my life that I am not aware of, God, that I am still standing today? How is it, God, that I'm still standing? And the third question would be, now what? Why, God, you have me here? 11-28, December 31st, 2011. When there could have been a reason, God, for you could have took me out six months ago, three and a half months ago, 36 hours ago. 
Why, God, am I still here, God? And how, God, you have me here this very minute and this very hour. And God, as I look towards 2012, God, I ask you the question, now what? You kept me around another 365 days. So God, I ask you, now what? First question, the why. First thing I say, why you're still standing, why you're still here, is because of your purpose. David says like this, he, he, you, you know my inward parts. You form me in my mother's womb. You have a purpose. Paul, was, Paul says like this in Ephesians 2.10, for you are his workmanship, created for a good work, created, prepared before the foundations of the world. You are still standing today. Why are you still standing today? Because God still has a purpose for you. There's still a reason why you are around. Come on, family, I, I need for you to really internalize this and begin to ask yourself the question, where could I have been if it had not been for God on my side? Some of you I know who've traveled around the country flying in airplanes, would have been if God would have not been with you while you was on the airplane? I spoke to my father a few, uh, Christmas, Christmas day, or right before Christmas, and he was telling me how, you know, the neighborhood where I grew up at, a lot of houses are being broken into, and his house have yet to be broken into in all these years, especially since I've been gone, 20 years I've been gone from home, and the neighborhood got increasingly worse. And the only thing I can think of is the grace of God. So you, you, you gotta begin to, you, you really gotta begin to ask yourself these questions. God, why am I still here? Why, God, does it really matter that I am even around? If at any time you feel that you, you are just existing and you're not fulfilling something meaningful, I want to challenge you this morning to challenge you to know that you are here because of your purpose. And until your purpose is fulfilled, you will still be standing. Second reason why you're still here or why you're still standing, because of your destiny. Your purpose is that which you were created for. Your destiny is the path along to the journey. You feel me? I kind of want to separate the two. It can go hand in hand. There's a lot of overlap there. I want to kind of get to see the purpose which you was created for. Your destiny is the road that you will travel to get to the fulfillment of your purpose. You're still standing because your destiny has not yet been complete. You're still standing because your destiny has not yet been traveled. You're still standing because your destiny awaits you. God, speak to their hearts, Father. Speak to their spirits, God. God, encourage them as they walk into 2012 to know, God, that they have a purpose and that their destiny, God, awaits for them. Number three, why are you still standing? To give you a testimony. You, you, it, it does God little good, all depends on the circumstances, we'll say that's different, all depends on the circumstances, that he would take you out of here if you not have a testimony. You're still standing, family, because you have a testimony and you are here now to testify to the goodness and the grace of God. Think about it. There may be other people that you may know of that may have passed this year. And you may ask yourself the question, why did them and not me? Because you have a purpose. Your destiny awaits and because God has a testimony, you are a living testimony that your experience that you would you experience in 2011 and when you're going to 2012, know that God is using you, and that's why you are still standing. Number five. Number five. You're still standing to show forth the glory of God. God wants to get glory out of his situation. God wanted to get glory out of Samson. Sure, God could have created, God could have created something where Samson could have defeated the Philistines long before he got his eyes, his eyes gouged out. 
But because God wanted a testimony to the Philistines of who he is, and because God wanted to show his glory to the Philistines through who he is, he waited until uh, till Samson was at his very end. Until he got all the people together. 3,000 men and women, the scripture says. They were all looking and laughing at him. Ah, like, oh, look at Samson. Look at the strong Israelite. Look at him. Ah, oh, yeah, but then he positioned himself between the middle pillars. One to the left and the other to the right. And he cried out aloud, God, one last time. Strengthen me, God. Let me die with the Philistines that I may kill these folks. And scripture says he killed more people in that one instant instance that he did his whole life. Second question we must ponder this evening. How is God doing it? How is it that God is still keeping you around? How is it that God still have you standing? The first thing I want to say family, he is doing it by his grace. Paul says like this in 2 Corinthians my grace is sufficient for you. God's grace is keeping you. We don't even know it. God's grace is falling behind you. We don't even sense that God is around. Yet even the more his grace is all around you. God is keeping you. You are still standing. How are you still standing? Because God's grace is all around you and follows you everywhere you go. Secondly, how is God keeping you? He's keeping you by his mercy. You know what the psalmist say? Marvin says, by his grace and his mercy, I'm alive. It's because of his grace, here I am. It's by his grace and his mercy that God is keeping you. Psalm 25, 10 says, all the paths of the Lord are mercies and truth to those who obey and keep his commands. As you're walking about your day, you're obeying God, you're keeping his care, you're trying to live right, uprightly before him, his grace is keeping you. You're walking in the path of righteousness, and as you're walking in the path of righteousness, you're having grace that is following you everywhere you go. His mercy is following you everywhere you go. How are you, how is it that you're still standing this evening? By his grace and his mercy. Number three. How is it that you're still standing? by his power it's not just his grace and his mercy but it's also his power all power belongs to God so when, when you might think something is going to go wrong or when you might think an action is going to happen God says my power has withheld you or my power has, uh, has kept you out of this circumstance out of this or his power has got you through this trial this stress and this tribulation I'm still standing by his grace. People say, how do you do this? How do you raise four kids and try to have, you know, raise a church and go to work and have a while? How do you do it? Only thing I can ever apply to them is by his grace. Because I know I don't do everything as I'm supposed to be doing. But it's because of God's grace and his mercy operating in our lives that we are still standing here today as the same with you and number four why are you still standing or how you're still standing by his love god loves you with an infinite love remember family, this all goes back to your destiny and your purpose he keeps you he upholds you by his grace his mercy his power and his love so that he can fulfill his purpose in you you were created you are his craftsmanship you are his workmanship you were created to do good works which were prepared for you before the foundations of the world. Uh, Paul says like this in Philippians. He is able to, he who began a good work in you will complete it. He will complete it. You're still standing this evening. You're still standing and going into 2012 because God has a good work for you. I want you to listen. I want you to get this in your hearing this evening. That there is a work for you to be doing. There's something other than going to work, raising kids, eating good food, driving nice cars. There's something other than those things that God has for you. It is a good work that God has for you. And your purpose and your destiny, your happiness is found in that. 
Last question to ponder. Okay, God, now what? That's what I want to know. As I go into 2012, I'm thankful, God, that you have brought me to this place. God, I'm thankful that you kept my family. God, I'm thankful that you kept us from harm, hurt, or danger. But God, I ask you now, now what? Now what with this ministry? Now what with this church? Now what with my family? Now what with everything that I have a question for? God, now what? That should be the question that we all should be asking ourselves coming into 2012. Okay, God, thank you very much. We're grateful for your love and your grace, your mercy, and your power. But God, now what? What is to happen, God, with our lives coming into 2012? First one we need to do is be thankful. Now what? Be thankful. Some folks didn't make it. Some folks still here, but they crazy in the mind. Some folks still around that you might know, but they're, they're struggling. So be thankful for God's grace, mercy, love, and power in your life. Be thankful that God has given you a purpose. Be thankful that you are still standing. Number two, Serve the Lord. You all know this stuff. Serve the Lord. As you come into 2012 and you say, God, thank you for bringing me here. Now what? Now God says, begin to serve me. Or serve me all the more. Number three, obey his word. Keep his word near your heart. He tells Joshua, Joshua 1, he says, Obey, meditate on my word day and night. Don't let it depart from your mouth and you will have good success. You will make your way prosperous. Obey his word. Three, number four, number four. Be strong and courageous. When the trials and the tests and the tribulations of 2012 come, Remember to be strong and courageous. Remember what God has brought you through in 2011, in 2010, in, 20, in 2009. Be strong and courageous. Like Ms. Judith said earlier, they will come. Some of us may face those trials within the first 10 days of this year. They will come. But be strong and courageous, knowing that God has a purpose and a destiny for you, and that's why you are still standing. Number five, submit your will to God. Surrender it all. So hard for us to do. But maybe some here can attest to that surrendering is a freedom a freedom of knowing that God, you got everything under control. Right. Surrendering tells us, or surrendering gives us that feeling, that total dependence on God, that leaning on God, that we could not otherwise experience if we don't first surrender. And lastly, now what? Praise the Lord. Praise the Lord. Just praise the Lord. Declare his goodness. Declare the works that he is doing. Let the folks know, let people know that God is good and that he is doing great things for you. Let folks know that what God is doing in your life gives your folk the glory of God through your life. And know that while you're doing so, family, you're bringing joy to the Lord. That you're, 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 you're bringing glory to God. I, you know, I'm not a hype type person. So whether it's New Year's Eve, Christmas Day, July 4th, I only going to give what God tells me to give. I, I, can't, I, can't, I can't pretend to be a, a, a hooper. I can't pretend to be a big church down on down the street is going to hype you all up and whatnot, but I hope and I pray that God has given us given us to see you through the word some sustenance that's going to take us beyond New Year's Day. Because right. I'm a big believer that after the hype is all settled, 
That's when it really comes to count. You see, if, if, if I'm not knocking those churches out there, but I just know for me and how I learn and receive, teach me. Don't hype me up. Been in that environment before. I was just hype, 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 hype. And, and when, it, when it came down to facing a trial, I, I didn't remember anything that I was all hyped about. But when you teach me, then I'm taught the word so that I can learn that. You're still standing. Be pleased with what God has allowed you to go through and to experience this year. I would venture to think that a lot of people probably want some of your experience based on what they might have experienced. See, but God knows what you have. He created you. He formed you. And he's given you a purpose and a destiny. And because of that family, you can stand strong and be courageous and walk into 2012 knowing that God will never leave you. Knowing that God still yet has a purpose for you. the children of his voice. I know the plans I have. Not to harm you. No plans of evil. God don't have plans of evil for us. Why would he want to, uh, uh, to, to bestow evil on us? For we are his children and if we are his children then we know that all these things are going to work out for his glory and if it's for his glory then we're going to get something out of it too. The trials and the tests for his glory that we're going to get some out of it too. Amen? Amen. Let us pray. Father, in the name of Jesus, we thank you, God. We glorify you. God, I pray this word will minister to your people well beyond this evening, well beyond January 1st, well beyond the middle of the year. God, it's as they reflect on this New Year's Eve service, God, that you will remind them, Father, over and over again that they are still standing because they have a purpose that they are still standing because of your grace and your mercy and God when they ask the questions now what what now what do I do next give them clear direction God bring the members this message God bring the members all the things that you've shared with them throughout this year we bless you, we glorify you.